Jesus. Amen. Have you ever taken one of those quizzes where you find your purpose? You know, where one is strongly agree and five is absolutely do not agree? Well, you're not alone if you've done this, if you've clicked, if you've submitted your answers and you anxiously awaited for the screen to pop up with what your purpose was in life, what the ultimate purpose was based on your specific one to five answers. <laughs> in the research that I found provided by the fabulous Dr. Google this week, <laughs> I found all sorts of articles about how to find your purpose, your calling. In fact, there is this good indication, for example, that people who have a strong sense of purpose actually live longer. That people who decided that there was something bigger than themselves. In fact, one study, the researchers, they looked at these people at the age of 50 and over and asked them questions that were tied to the person's sense of purpose. Then this sample group was tracked for a number of years to see what happened. And over time, the data revealed that the stronger the participants felt that they had a purpose in life, the lower their risk of depression or disease or even death. I will say that though this research was uh, done with a purpose, I will say some of the language used is not true because we know that we don't know the hour or the day that God calls us home. But I feel that the data was trying to communicate that the risk of dying within a particular time frame was significantly reduced for people who had this strong sense of purpose or a strong drive, a goal in mind. Having a purpose not only increased their life expectancy, it was also linked to other aspects of well-being, such as better sleep and healthier behaviors. People with a sense of purpose of being a part of something bigger than themselves not only lived longer, but they also seemed to live fuller. Not perfect, but purposeful lives. And so the question for us to consider this morning is, if we are the clay, what then is our purpose of our vessel? If we are the clay, what then is the purpose of our vessel? That question is really at the crux of today's sermonic response, the scripture found in Jeremiah chapter 18. It may be a familiar passage to you because it's the story of the potter's house. It reads as thus. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does? declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you my hand, Israel. Those who wish to affirm this holy word, let us together say amen. Amen. You know, personally, I have never sat behind the potter wheel. Years ago, though, at a United Methodist women's retreat, I was able to watch a live potter do a demonstration and how she made her cup that was kind of mushy, <laughs> and it was really fascinating. But since I've had minimal exposure to creating pottery, I figured it best to speak directly to someone who is a potter. So I reached out to one of my friends who does pottery as a hobby, and she's rather good. And in our conversation, I asked her what might be the cause for a pottery vessel to go bad or to spoil. And it turns out that there are a myriad of things that can go wrong when throwing a pot. Starting with the way that the clay is actually prepared. If a potter doesn't properly uh, knead the clay before placing it on the wheel, there are these little air bubbles inside that cause weak spots in the piece. And if the potter doesn't center the clay properly when placing it on the slab, 
the lump will just distort as the wheel spins. And even with a successful start, a piece can spoil in the potter's hands. I found out that water is also vital to the process of shaping the clay, but too much water, it will go soggy and mushy. Perhaps pressure is also a point that can go wrong. Pressure, I see, is the only way, she told me, to mold this kind of formless lump. But if you put too much pressure, the vessel will be too thin in some places and perhaps too thick in others. And then, she said, there's this matter of my hands, my pottery hands. If they're unsteady, the clay will just mush. My hands control the movements of the clay, and so without steady hands, I cannot do my work. In all of these scenarios, the result was effectively the same. The clay will falter. It might flop over on fold or fold over on itself, and sometimes it will just completely collapse. And then this vessel is beyond repair. The cup a blob. It's spoiled right in the potter's hand. And so the, the potter has to cut it from the wheel, knead it again, center it, and shape it anew. In today's text, my friends, Jeremiah witnesses this very process we've just seen. He witnesses this process with his own eyes, and he sees this vessel there on the wheel, and the potter making, and he encounters this vessel folding over, spoiling in the potter's very hands. And so this potter has to begin again, reworking it into a different kind of vessel. God has sent Jeremiah, often referred to as this weeping prophet, to the potter's house, very passionate and emotional, telling Jeremiah, there I will let you hear my words. So Jeremiah goes and visits this village potter, a, a craftsperson who would have been essential to their community, and he observes this artist at work. God did not just send Jeremiah with words, he sought him with a purpose. He sent him so that he would be ready to receive. And so the prophet watches the clay wobble on the wheel, and I imagine Jeremiah sees it flop over or fold in on itself or just fall down. But because the potter deems the vessel unusable, because the potter says this is beyond repair, it's spoiled, the potter has to then begin again, shaping this clay into something different, something that the scripture tells us is, seems good to the potter. Jeremiah's trip to the potter's house is not about a spoiled vessel. It's not exactly about the clay or even the hands of the potter that shape it. This story is about God and God's people. It's about the one who established the covenant of Israel and the one who forsake or forsook that covenant. Remember, God said, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? Here in this potter's house, here in this village, the word of the Lord comes alive. The living word comes alive to Jeremiah. And it is a word of judgment, a word of warning. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doing, says the Lord. Otherwise, it seems Israel's fate will be the same as this vessel that was spoiled in the potter's hand. The nation will be deemed beyond repair. The house of Israel in this time period was certainly in need of reform, my friends. These people had turned away from the God of their ancestors. They didn't heed the words of the Lord or heed the prophet's words. And so they chose instead to worship these gods that were other than the, the God of Israel. And in so doing, they abandoned the ways of God. Instead of providing for the orphan and the widow, some in the community were taking the goods of others. 
taking advantage of the disadvantage. Jeremiah notes earlier within chapter 5 of the book that instead of caring for the poor, some grew fat while others starved. The people have abandoned the laws of the covenant, which ensure that the whole community, not just one individual, but the whole community would flourish. So God sends this weeping prophet to call the people back. Just like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, God said. Turn now, all of you, from your ways, your evil ways, and amend your ways. Amend your doings, says the Lord. This metaphor is not a perfect one. This image of the clay in the, in the potter's hands, after all, it's the potter's hands that are making the mistakes if the clay falls over. For clay has no free will or autonomy. Clay cannot choose either to pull itself into a pot or a bowl or even to decide, I'm finished, I'm going to collapse on the wheel. But within this story, when it comes to Israel, within this scriptural passage, the fault lies with the clay and not with the potter. And the house of Israel is indeed very much a spoiled vessel. It's lost its center. The foundation is no longer solid. It's not grounded in this covenantal law or oriented toward its covenant-keeping God. It's become distorted, out of balance. The community which is supposed to ensure that all people have what they need to flourish is too thin in some places and overly thick in others. This house has become rather wobbly. It looks like it might just fold over. It may even fall down completely. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like this clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. It sounds rather ominous. Like God is maybe ready to walk away from this covenant community. Like God is maybe frustrated. Like the potter is content to just maybe quit the clay. From the tone of this word from the Lord, we would expect to find the potter just washing their hands of this mess. While this clump of lay, clay just lies there, abandoned. But we know that's not what happens. That's not how the story goes. The potter doesn't scrap the pot. They, they don't scrape the clay from the wheel and throw it in the trash bin. Quite the opposite. The potter begins again. Kneads the clay, centers it on the wheel, and shapes it into this new thing. Even before Jeremiah received the word of the Lord, even before he hears this summons to repentance, the prophet witnesses this act of grace. He watches this, this potter work and rework the clay until it becomes a vessel that is good to sight. It's not a perfect metaphor, but this image of clay in the potter's hand, this image teaches us that God is the potter. Always remolding, always remaking, reshaping, forming and reforming, exerting pressure when, when the clay begins to wobble, pulling or pulling the walls into place when the pot starts to flop or fold, laboring tirelessly at the wheel until the vessel is solid and sturdy. Not necessarily perfect, but good and made with a purpose in God's sight. This is the way of God. And it seems this has always been the way of God, who has been working with clay since the dawn of time. 
In the second creation story in Genesis, our maker molded the first human from dust of the earth and breathed into the being the breath of life. And the one who went on to sculpt the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields and the dogs in our houses and the second human from the form of the first worked with clay from the beginning. So all creation might be complete, might be good. This God continues to work the clay. God, the the potter, shapes and reshapes, sometimes remaking us completely. Until we are fashioned and ready for holy purposes. Can I not do with you, O people of Calvary, just as this potter has done? And our hope-filled answer is yes. Yes, God, yes, you can reform and, and, and shape us. Yes, God, you can do and make and remake us as you have done for a hundred years. Shaping us with your steady hand, hand fully, trusting in us to be vessels used for you, firmly pulling the clay into position and gently molding us when we waver, lovingly attending to flaws and weak spots Indeed, the potter returns to the wheel over and over again, reworking this until the vessel is good. Like our ancestors within the covenant community, we know that we will wobble. We know what it's like to fall down, to doubt, sometimes because of mistakes we've made, sometimes by choices that are not the best. Sometimes even because of circumstances beyond our control. So maybe we've lost our center, or maybe we've just spun out of control, out of balance. Maybe the weight has just become unbearable, and we're teetering and tottering, headed towards collapse. Whatever the reason, we've all had moments, or even seasons, or even decades, when we wobble or falter. When it looks like we just might flop over in or on ourselves. Like we might fall down completely. But the potter, no matter how much we falter, no matter how vulnerable we are to collapse, the potter looks at us and does not deem us lost. In the potter's hands, nothing is beyond repair. When I look back and examine my own life, I can see how how God's been shaping my journey thus far. Always transforming and reforming, guiding, directing me, making and changing me as this divine potter. After all, I didn't just wake up one day and decide, I'm going to be used as a vessel pastor. Nope. But when I look back on God's providence, when I look back on God's provenient grace, that grace that brought me into pastoral ministry before I even knew what that meant, I see how God molded and provided the skills every step of the way from when I was a little girl helping my dad pass out hymnals in the nursing home or greeting people at the door saying hello at church, or how I was given opportunity to travel for months and months on a mission team across the country in college. And even though I often fought the potter's hands molding me, even though there were moments of great doubt and uncertainty and despair and heartache, this potter, this God, never stopped creating me to be a vessel used for God's glory even in all my weaknesses. Preparing my heart to trust God's call to leave my home and to go to seminary. My point in sharing all of this is to give evidence of how God's working was always upon me in so many ways. How God's provenient grace, that grace comes before we know it, leads all of us into the choice that we have to trust in God, to believe in God, to see God's justifying grace within us, 
And friends, I believe that God, the potter, does this and is working and creating in your lives, in the lives of those sitting next to you here today. Sure, it takes work on our part to be palatable, to be moldable. It takes choice, sacrifice, takes surrender. But we know that God is always continually at the wheel, refusing to quit the clay, tirelessly working at the wheel of our lives, shaping, reshaping, because this, we know, is the way of God. It has always been the way of God from the dawn of time, the one who molds us when we wobble, the one who returns to the wheel time and time and time again until every vessel seems good in God's sight. Until it is molded into a channel for Christ's good works, it it is always the potter that's working on our behalf, evening us out. This story, this imagery, teaches us that each vessel the potter makes is different. So too God makes each one of us beautifully unique, with characteristics and qualities formed by the context with which the vessel has been made. Your lived experience is so valuable. Only you have the voice to share your story of how God has worked in your life. We've encountered this pottle making a vessel for a specific use in this story. Each item, cup, bowl, plate, has been crafted for a purpose. We can't carry water on a plate or knead dough in a teacup, perhaps. If you can, you're very talented. I'm reminded, as Dennis played this morning, you know, not all of us are gifted with music. Not all of us are engineers or work for the State Department or are teachers or nurses. But each of us has a unique gift. The potter, the master potter, the clay molder, the artist needs into us specific cultivated gifts that we are prompted to then share. I wonder what your unique characteristics are that God has placed in you. I wonder what things are part of your very soul that you naturally are inclined to do and have this talent. I hope you're working those things. I hope you're living out those things because they are indeed a gift. Perhaps this morning, though, you're unsure of what those gifts are. Perhaps you're unsure of your capability of being a vessel wholly used for Christ. Maybe you're feeling less than or not ready enough. Steel at work on the wheel and kind of weak. I'm reminded of a recent Bible study entitled Called that we studied at church not too long ago. And in one of the chapters, it challenged us that Peter had a temper. David had an affair, Noah got drunk, Jonah ran from God, Gideon was insecure, Miriam was a gossip, Martha was a worrier, Thomas was a doubter, Sarah was impatient, Elijah was moody, and we were reminded last week that Lazarus was dead. Yet all these people, all these vessels were used for good. Friends, the vessels God has and is forming us into qualifies us. We are called in all our colors, shapes, forms, even sometimes in our brokenness. Each of us are full of these individual gifts and graces that are linked to our divine purpose as vessels of the divine artist. I hope this prompts you to see how you can be using those things God has gifted you in the world today. To not sit back silently, but to be called into the doing and the working of God. In closing, I think it's important to mention that the conclusion of the research that I found from Dr. Google that I mentioned earlier found that the lives lived and those that are still living who chose to live purposeful lives found that Many candidates who applied to be part of the study 
did not have or feel a purpose. But they all marked that they were, they were looking for something. They were all in search or in need. And so friends, whether we find ourselves in search or in need this morning, we're reminded our purpose is that we are vessels, beautifully formed and sanctified to be conduits, instruments, voices that display God's gospel of justice, redemption, and mercy. God is our potter and we are the clay. And so may we just open up our lives to to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be molded as clay for Christ's continued good work. I pray this is your prayer. May we all be clay for Christ today and every day. Amen.